Right, we are starting. Commence, let battle commence. That's all right. That's all right. Would you like to see my King Crimson tie? This is a Japanese bootleg. Unauthorized merchandising from Japan. Sorry, as you were. We were just talking about your um, early experiences of seeing the uh, people who are now very big in uh, the music business, and perhaps some of those who you thought might have made it and haven't. Can you just Yes, it? yes, I can, yes. It, was, it seems like yesterday, actually, but of course there's been about 15 years of sweat and blood in between, but the rock music scene in England in the 60s was very exciting, very exciting. I can remember as a sort of 14-year-old going and standing in sweaty clubs and thrilling to the sound of people who later became stars, such as Mick Fleetwood, you know, who subsequently went off to Hollywood and became a big hero, and uh, John McLaughlin, who became a famous guitarist. I'm sure I needn't tell you that he became a famous guitarist. And other such people as that, Graham Bond, he died, unfortunately. Ginger Baker was an early drum, drum hero. But for a 14-year-old, this was a heady mix of uh, rhythm and blues. Uh, sort of Ray Charles type rhythm and blues, they all used to play Genius Plus Soul Equals Jazz, the famous Ray Charles album. And uh, it was exciting stuff, heady stuff for a 13 year old. Loud, too, extremely loud. Jack Bruce played the bass, upright. Um, John McLaughlin on guitar, Ginger Baker, Dick Hextel Smith. And then there was John Mayall's group, that was a big famous group. And all these people were, were players more in the sense uh, of, of playing ability and R&B and jazz rather than singer-songwriters, you know. So the, uh, the American equivalent at the time didn't make much impression. That all, all seemed to be blonde kids talking about surf riding and stuff, which I didn't understand at all. That all seemed to be different to me. So I, st I stuck very much with those kind of people who I thought were great. How did uh, Yes fall? A series of accidents, like all the best things. It was, it was one of those. There's a, a musical paper here in England called um, Melody Maker. Am I allowed to say Melody Maker? This is a commercial country we're speaking to. Uh, and that had a Musicians Wanted column. And I put an ad in there saying, you know, something modest like brilliant young drummer of excessive talent, you know, needs jobs, something informal and friendly like that. And uh, I think John Anderson rang up and answered the ad. And we all went off to a bar in uh, Soho and discussed. We being John Anderson, Chris Squire, myself, and another character called Clive Bailey, who I believe is credited with early, some early Yes music, but then subsequently was kind of left the band. Wanted to be a hairdresser, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Promises of great things to come. Um, we all went off to a bar and sort of discussed this for a bit. Um, at the end of a lot of drinking, they proposed that we go off to the Rachel Macmillan College of something or other in Deptford, East London, and play a gig. I said, fine, and anything in, anything in mind that we should play, we'd never played before, you know. And we played In the Midnight Hour by one Wilson Pickett for about 30 minutes. And I was very impressed by the fact that they could harmonize. It was a, a very much, right then it was vocally orientated, and that was exciting. I mean, that was very good. I'd not really heard singing, harmony singing before. I thought that was very impressive. But I played hard to get because I had a couple of other offers. I had a couple of um, soul bands that were offering a job at the same time, and I had them. They were going to pay thirty pounds a week at a current exchange rate, about thirty-five dollars a week, and uh, that was good money. That was fine. And um, yes, were not who weren't at that time called yes um, were going to promise absolutely nothing but <laughs> you know blood, sweat, and tears kind of thing. And, um, but I was much attracted by John Anderson and Chris Squire, who I thought were very imaginative people, and wanted to do something, as everybody does, called different, you know, to the current scene. And so I said, well, count me in, that sounds great. And we went off to a, to a little basement in Soho and rehearsed a lot. And some of the early music we rehearsed was quite odd. It was Vanilla Fudge, Diana Ross, Supremes, the Fifth Dimension made a, a, big, a big sort of indent in John Anderson's head particularly. They were a vocal group, and so he thought, well, what we'll do is we'll sing, we'll sing the vocal harmonies kind of the way they do, but we'll stretch the arrangements. And then we became known for doing long-winded versions of things like West Side Story and all kinds of odd music with some technical dexterity. 
at the time, what was considered great technical prowess. I mean, it was absolutely abysmal music, really. It was thoroughly wretched. But, but at the time, it seemed advanced, you know, bearing in mind the Beach Boys were doing whatever they were doing in, in England. There wasn't much else. So that's kind of how Yes started. Then I went off to college because I had a to university in Leeds in the north of England. I had a, a position offered there. And I said, the hell with Yes, they're not getting anywhere. You know, we'd done six months. And uh, I went off to college. They got an offer to play at the Royal Albert Hall in London, which was a big gig supporting the cream. At which point my college career looked like it was less fun than it was <laughs> going to be. I suddenly thought, well, it would be nice to to uh, play with them again. They came to Leeds University to play a gig. Regrettably, they had uh, an alcoholic drummer from a band called the Kubas, who once supported the Beatles. He was a great man, but he was about a quarter note behind the rest of the band. And if you know anything about music, that can be problematic. Um, they said, help. I said, I'm in. And off we went, and we did the Royal Albert Hall and, and proceeded to go downhill from then on for about two years, to the point where about two or three years later, we were pretty much destitute. We had the wrong manager, um, the wrong kind of records. In fact, everything about the group was more or less wrong at the time. Um, and we were just about to break up when we uh, recorded the Yes album and changed manager. And then, as they say, the rest is kind of history. What songs do you feel show Yes at their best? Well, I think, I think um, Yes was a very good pop group. And one of the laws of pop music is that, you know, the, the best songs are the hits. I mean, that's what pop groups are for. They make hits. And, and if everybody likes it, then it's the best song. So, you know, Owner of a Lonely Heart shows Yes at its best. But, of course, before that, in the fanciful and heady days of, of the early 70s, we thought we were a little more than a pop group. You see, we thought we were something a bit more artistic. I mean, all this sounds terrible now, of course, in retrospect, but, but we thought we could do something a bit more interesting than that. And Close to the Edge was a very good record, I think. That was about its fifth album. I think the group's fifth album. It was the last record that I recorded with them. It took three months to make, which is forever and a day. And these weren't sessions that lasted six hours. This was... You know, this was dusk till dawn or death, whichever came first. You know, and I used to fall asleep in the studio literally at about four in the morning and be woken, you know, by Chris Squire to the sound of his bass reverberating around the control room. You know, wake up, wake up, do you like this mix? You know, <laughs> and uh, we did actually make a good record, though. It was one of those absolutely ho uh, extraordinary kind of things where everything was right. A year earlier, everything had been wrong. By that stage, we had Eddie Offord, who was a young engineer, who subsequently went to Atlanta. A very good young man, and he was a very exciting character. And the, the group was hot. The material was adventurous, and by some miracle, that n really nobody could take credit for. It was a, an accident circumstance. We came up with a good record, and a record like uh, Close to the Edge or King Crimson's, what was that called? In the Court of the Crimson King sell as many copies now as they did 12 years ago, of course. What are your <clears throat> fond memories of that? Of yes? Fond memories? Um, I look on the whole thing, on the whole, as, as being a great experience. It was, it was a lot of fun, and of course it was my first group. Like a girl's first boyfriend, you know. I mean, it was, it was important. It was very important, you know. And... Um, on the whole, I thought we achieved fantastic things. And, and riding into JFK in a, in a limousine and, and seeing that our album, I mean, we were only four or five kids from England kind of thing, seeing that our album was, was number three in the American chart, you know, a couple of shades under Frank Sinatra, surprised the heck out of me. I thought it was great, it was fantastic. At the same time, I didn't want to continue with that. It seemed to me a bit like a bank robbery, you know, you'd sort of... You, 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 you carried out this amazing trick. You'd made it. You know, fantastic. And in the making of it, then the thing went cold. Once you've made it, why bother to sustain that was my thing. And then I, I, I left the group. But it was very hard to explain to others why wishing to continue having made it seemed like an incredibly boring idea to me. That seemed, making it is everything. 
I think, and well, whatever terms you choose to pick, but to continue going round and round America, playing ever bigger stadiums, the same music every night, with an absolutely predictable reaction, it seemed to me to be the most intolerable thing on earth. Um, and so I made a change to another band. Who were your musical influences? Um, anybody who ever appeared on my record player, of course. And uh, when, I, when I grew up, I went to a kind of uh, a private boarding school. And you, you come very much under the sway of other older boys there. And there was a fully-fledged jazz orchestra. There was a jazz quartet, very good jazz drummer. The jazz record collection was about this big, all imports from the States. And the Beatles and Rolling Stones appeared, and you know, they were two albums about this big. And they didn't make any impression at all, really. We all sat down and dutifully listened to Please Please Me, which you may remember, I'm sure you're far too young, was an early Beatles record. And um, everybody said, well, I can't, I can't hear anything happening there at all. <laughs> you see, from, a, from a, a player's point of view, there wasn't that much happening on Beatles records. It was a song thing. And I came very late in the day to the idea of listening to the song. I'm a drummer. And for me, everything that was exciting about the tune was the instruments. The fact that some nauseous wimp had to sing on top about, I love you, I love you, you know, please hold my hand, didn't cut it either way for me at all. That seemed to be incredibly dull and got in the way of the instruments. Of course, the singers always think that the instruments are getting in the way of the song, but the players always think the song's getting in the way of the instruments. So really, there's no denying the fact that uh, I was brought up as a jazz drummer, that, that if you're interested in drumming, and the same thing applies today, if you're interested in drumming, the place you go to is not to Duran Duran or Spandau Ballet, you go to jazz, because that's where, in the Western world, the most advanced drumming exists. And if you want to listen to good ideas and hear what can be done on a drum set, you go to jazz and you hear the best of the black American players right now, and some very good English and white Americans too, but primarily it's an Afro-American art form. So I grew up with that, and when I heard Charlie Watts playing with the Stones, I liked Charlie very much, he's a dear man, but I couldn't understand what all the fuss was about, you know, I couldn't, couldn't see it. So it, it puts it in perspective. I was a player more than a singer, singer-song man. Who are your drum heroes? Well, all the, all the guys, that, that all the, the, the big American names through the 60s, which would be Max Roach and Art Blakey and Philly Joe Jones and Tony Williams and Elvin Jones. Uh, and since in England, in the late 60s, there were only a couple of other drummers that anybody knew about. One was Ginger Baker, who was terrific, <clears throat> basically a jazz player anyway. And he went on to be in The Cream and lots of other famous bands. But anyway, Ginger was terrific when he was young, thin, hungry, and lean. He was great. Um, and the other guy was Carl Palmer, who had the world's fastest snare drum roll. You know, and of course, in music, there's always, there's always a position for the man with the best, you know, the best technical dexterity. So there was Ginger, and there was Carl, and it wasn't very difficult to, uh, you know, if you were given other challenging musicians in the group, to add a little something to drumming as it was in the late 60s and late 70s. And I'd like to feel I made a small contribution. But in England, influences were very rare. England is not a drumming country. America or South America or India or Africa or China or Japan are drumming countries. England has no drumming worth talking about. What musicians have you played with and why? Well, uh, I've been very lucky and always played with musicians I very much admired. You see, that's another whole thing that may, may be done differently now. I mean, I'm sure if the drummer from Duran Duran was here now, he'd probably say, what is this? This is a new, a new idea. But in those days, <laughs> said he delicately, in the late 60s, 70s, um, the idea was that you sort of progressed. And the idea was that, that you, you tried to get better as a musician and hopefully made the music better music. You weren't only after a hit song. In fact, a hit song wasn't, wasn't necessary at all. Because in those days, the record industry was flush with money. Nobody needed hit songs. That was Frank Sinatra's business. You know, let him make the hits. We'll play the funny. We'll play the weird music. Um, what was the question? It was a great question. But <laughs> what musicians have you played with and admired? So as part of this general, general feeling in me that I wanted to progress, I played with musicians usually who were better than me. That's a number one trick. You see, always play with somebody who's better than you. Then you learn about music. So 
from the early days with John Anderson and then through King Crimson with Robert Fripp and Jamie Muir, a very good percussionist. Um, on then, I then picked people that I more or less wanted to play with for specific reasons. Gone. Dave Stewart, not the Eurythmics Dave Stewart, I hasten to add. Um, the other Dave Stewart, who had a very good band called National Health. Genesis were good. Um, UK was good. Alan Holdsworth in there is one of my favorite musicians. Uh, more King Crimson, Tony Levin and Adrian Ballou in King Crimson now are both superb musicians. Tony Levin's played with everybody. He was probably on These Boots Are Made For Walking we were talking about earlier. You know, Tony Levin's played with everybody. All that Paul Simon stuff, marvelous musician. Um, the last person I played, I think I just played with uh, Aldi Miola and Jamaluddin Takuma from Philadelphia, both great guys. David Murray, saxophone player. I've been very lucky. It's, it's partly luck. I mean, I sit here and tell you it's luck, but in fact it also is sort of skillful negotiating through some choppy waters to try and play with the people who you think you can gain something from. And I don't mean 80 quid. I mean, you know, something you can learn something from, and that's how you develop as a musician. That's how you provide your own future, and that's why you're interviewing me now. <laughs> Simple. Can you describe your perception of the American rock scene in the 60s? Well, it was rather a distant foreign country, America. I remember just on the eve of my first American tour, um, asking my father, you know, if, if, if he knew where, whether California was on the right or the left of the country, and he thought the right. You know, in other words, we, we, were, a, we were a long way from America. My father wasn't sure where California was. I located Boston on the map just before we played there kind of thing. I didn't know anything about America. I knew it had jazz, and I drunk that like crazy. I was, couldn't get enough of that. Um, but American pop, or uh, the more lightweight music of, of the Beach Boys and uh, around that kind of late, late 60s, early 70s stuff, I, I didn't know anything about it at all, past, apart from Pamela Motown, Smokey Robinson. All that Pamela Motown and stuff, you'll find a lot of people like me will tell you they loved all that, and they did indeed. And uh, Aretha Franklin, you know, I mean, if Aretha Franklin comes as she did recently to play in Victoria, here in London, I, I'll go and I'll, I'll just die for Aretha Franklin. I think she's wonderful. So on the whole, the blacker side of American pop appealed to me more than the lighter, whiter side. Can you describe the rock music scene in England in the late 60s and early 70s? Yes, very easily. Very easily. It was very, very exciting. But that was all due to a group called the Beatles. Remember them? You see, they appeared in 64 or 65 or 66 or something and, and started doing everything their own way, which was considered very odd that suddenly you didn't need A&R people, you didn't need record companies, uh, you could design your own album sleeve, you could be there at the mix of your record. What's more, you could have some say about the words that you sang. I mean, all this was wonderful, you know. And so the Beatles, apart from making good music, um, have a lot you know, to be thanked for. So we all started busily doing the same things as they were doing, making weird kind of acid-ridden records, you know, and, and generally behaving in an odd fashion, making long, winded instrumentals. And somehow the industry, being fairly flush with money as it was at the time, could support all this. Nobody kept ringing us up, ringing yes up, for example, and saying we must have a hit. You know, nobody, nobody minded about hits. That didn't really seem to be an important thing. Um, so the Beatles blew everything wide open which was fantastic, and, and all that you had to do was be um, different from the previous band. Kind of unlike now, where kids regrettably have to be very like the previous band in order to get a job. You see what I mean? And then the whole thing was, if you sound like, if the bands that were around when I started, namely Yes, King Crimson, Moody Blues, Nice, Jethro Tull, etc. If you sounded like any of those people, forget it. You know, the point was to be different. And that's slightly different now. You know? And so it was very exciting. We could do anything we wanted to do, and did. Talking about those other bands, um, in this program, it's about the progressive rock scene. And we're highlighting bands such as Traffic and Jeff Tile, Genesis, ERP, Yes, and Lincoln. Any comment on any of these bands? Yes, all those bands I knew, of course, and grew up with, and know all the musicians and all those people, and uh, you know, we're all buddies and, and had, a, had a good time on the whole. Now there are those amongst us who would wish to put as much distance as they can 
between now, 1984, and what this program probably calls progressive music. You know, not my term, I hasten to add. I mean, I thought all music was progressive. It wasn't until I, you know, I came to felt, felt for country music that I realized that there was a, musicians didn't want to progress. That seemed to me to be an odd idea. So anyway, the, the term progressive um, is usually, usually used to describe a lot of those bands that you just mentioned. And there are those who would say, well, now sneer at it. Those who participated would now sneer at it and say, well, of course, it was all rubbish, you know. But on the whole, it wasn't rubbish. But, you know, there were musicians trying their best. They were terribly naive, very green, hopeless musicians on the whole. No more hopeless, however, than the musicians in the round of punk scene in the early 70s. And they just wanted to amuse themselves on their instruments then, as they do now. Um, so it was a harmless thing. But, like a lot of these movements, it became excessive, as did the so-called punk thing, and it dies of its own excess. Out of sheer weight of tedium, it died of its own excess. And to give him his credit, Robert Fripp is one of the few people who, with whom I was touring in 1974, and in whose group King Crimson, we were about to become successful. I mean, we were only a pip or two away, and in the logical step of things, you would only have had to appear in America for another couple of tours or another couple of years, and all would have been well. You know, the suitable status would have been accorded you, dollars would have been thrown at you, and everything continues as it should continue. To give him his credit, Robert Fripp is one of the few people who understood that so-called progressive music had become excessive and he would have no more part of it. That's why he broke up one of those type of groups called King Crimson. We saw King Crimson as totally different from all the other bands, those Jethro Tales and stuff that you saw, that you mentioned. Um, we saw it as a completely different group, but we were all lumped together as being the same thing, tarnished with the same brush. And he quite rightly and quite courageously, and to our mutual manager's great consternation, sat on the group in 1974 and said, stop, we have had enough. Which I thought was brave and honorable on the whole. Well, my current activities now are, of course, exactly the same activities as they were when I was 13, which is that I, I sit down daily and look between my legs and see a 14-inch snare drum sitting there. Had you worry about And, and th there it is, you know, and there's a drum set, and there's two cymbals, and the problems are exactly the same. You know, I mean, you know, can you, can you do this, and can you do that, and can you do this, and then that very quickly, spontaneously, and, and so forth. The same, in other words, I'm a student of music. This thing that we're talking about, pop music, is this kind of um, sort of difficult hurdle. It's the environment in which I have to live, but my greater uh, feel for the thing is that I'm a long-term musician. I'll be playing drums when I'm 60, and hopefully you'll be interviewing me when I'm old and grey, you know, and we'll talk about these same subjects, and you'll ask me what I'm doing now, and I'll say I'm sitting there with a the drum set, same as always. Nothing ever changes. Um, but I know what you mean. I'm playing... Uh, currently with a, a very good pianist called Patrick Moraz, who um, is somebody you might know from what we call a progressive group called the Moody Blues, who quite probably should have stopped about 10 years ago, but didn't. Patrick Moraz is, for his day job, he plays with them, but at night he comes out with me and we go and play in New York and we play acoustic piano and drums, just Clean, not an amplifier on stage. Can you believe it? Not an amplifier. Well, you would think that young American folk would get nervous, wouldn't you, without an amplifier on stage? Not a bit of it. They are amazed to, to be shown what can be done on a piano and a drum set. And we have conversations between the two of us, like now. So I, I play that. I should also add, perhaps, <clears throat> cut. I should also add, perhaps, that I'm with a better known group called King Crimson which uh, plays quite a bit and, and offers its contributions as and when it can to the general musical milieu. What are your overviews of the rock music in the 60s, 70s and 80s? Ah, my overviews of rock music in the 60s, 70s, 60s, 70s and 80s? Well, that's my overview of rock. What's my attitude to rock? Oh, bless it. Bless it. It's a difficult little beast. It's an adolescent that won't lie down. It won't ever grow up, which I'm entirely grateful for. Um, and on the whole, it's been very good to me, and I enjoy playing to lots of people. And I enjoy the challenge in trying to make those people like it. Um, and a lot of subterfuge can be used, employing, it can be employed trying to get those people to like your music. 
But on the whole, I like rock, although it should not be forgotten that, that um, much of the interesting music that's around, and certainly the music that influences drummers, comes from outside of rock. Rock is a great big melting pot, and it, it, it draws all its interesting sources, you know, be it mime with David Bowie, or acting with this particular singer, or, or the jazz influence of drumming, or, or jazz harmony on the keyboards, or gospel vocal music. It draws all its influences from outside sources, the so-called minority musics. So if you're interested in music, you invariably gravitate towards the minorities of your particular you know, choice. Rock itself is, um, is a commercial kind of uh, stew made up of all these things, and it's religiously flogged round and round again to the same incoming crop of adolescents. I see them as like lambs to the slaughter, 16-year-olds, one after another. You know, they all come in and all fed the same thing. If you've been around in rock for a little while, the overwhelming feeling of the whole thing is that it's cyclical. It comes around in seasons, and the seasons are seven years long. And the reason for that is because kids come into the thing at 14 and quit at 21, you know, and, and the record company is selling the same thing around again. So Boy George is Tamla Motown, and da 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 and we've had, it all, we've had it all before. So with somebody who's been around a bit, it's very hard for him to say, oh, well, gee, you know, I really love Spandau Ballet, because I would simply be deceiving you if I said that. I can see the influences and why people like Spandau Ballet and Duran Duran exist very clearly and bless them for being there and existing, but it's just that I, it doesn't, it's not for me. You see, it's not designed for me. As such, I resent it, in fact. I wish people were designing music for me. And they do, but not in rock. So in, in a way, King Crimson and the kind of bands I'm in um, actually play to the people who are aware of what I'm talking about and who've actually bought this stuff once and kind of are now interested in broadening a little bit and saying, well, we've had that trick once. It was a great trick, thank you very much. But now let's have something a bit broader. So that's where King Crimson comes in. Invariably plays to uh, a sort of college student and up. Kids who've, who've been around a bit and, you know, sort of smell what's going on, smell something funny in this whole commercial thing. 60s, 70s and 80s rock, I've loved it all, really. And uh, I've got a big record collection and it has current records and old records, you know. And it's all interesting. What are some of your favorite records? Well, I'm a drummer, you see, so naturally I monitor drum trends. I mean, if you're, if you're a dress designer, you, man, you monitor, presumably, you, you monitor uh, fashion in foreign countries, usually, and see what's going on. My profession is I'm a drummer, so I must know what this year's rhythm is. And make no mistake, you have this year's rhythm, the same as you have this year's dress or this year's boots. You know, it's, it's all entirely fashionable. So I listen to a lot of pop music for um, what's going on in the studio technology side of things. But uh, on the playing end of things, of course, you know, I'd, I'd have to cite Tony Williams, the, the American uh, jazz drummer, as being an overwhelming influence. But on the song side of things, I mean, if you're going to play me All Right Now by Free, I'm your man. I mean, I'd, uh, just terrific. Pop at its best can, can be absolutely wonderful in three minutes, you know, putting this little, little thing together that, that uh, touches everybody is a wonderful trick and, and very impressive. And I've always been on the outside of that, really. I'm usually the guy, I'm the rhythm consultant, you know. Get Bill in, you know, rhythm consultant to the stars. I'm the guy who will supply you a 17-8 -8 meter or something, you know. Um, so my principal interest is in the drumming side of things, but I do monitor a lot of pop and rock and jazz, and ethnic music, and classical music. You know, in two days' time, I'm, I'm going to the Amsterdam Symphony to play with their percussion group, for example. In other words, people like me, uh, I'm supposed to be a rock musician, but I'm not really. You know, I sort of, I'm in it, but I'm not really. I, sort of, I want my cake, and I want to eat it, too. How did uh, UK come about? UK, well, there was a group for you. That was uh, a little nightmarish, actually. It was the kind of thing that went rather wrong. Um, a good idea at the time, an honest attempt. What, what happened was we had a four-piece group. It was like tennis. We had a couple of pop stars at one end and a couple of players at the other. Now, I'm now an experienced man and can tell you that on the whole, pop stars and players don't really mix well together. Um, the ones that wished to be stars and subsequently went on to Asia and other big famous groups don't do don't mix easily with the more artistic side, the people who will die for their instrument, 
basically, and who have uh, actually a purity of motif, a, a purity of motive that that um, isn't necessarily about uh, creating a machine that will produce as much money as possible in the shortest possible time, which is the general ethic that we work in. We had Holdsworth and uh, myself as the sort of playing element, and a couple of pop stars, John Wetton and Eddie Jobson, both of whom wrote good material, but we couldn't quite get on. We tried to, we nearly did, the record company got very excited, they started calling us superstars, and from then on, it might have uh, continued. It was a much loved group, actually. It had a, a, a good first album, and it might have continued effectively had the record company and others not been so greedy so quickly. But greed is an occupational hazard. It's everywhere. This might have answered that question. Is this any good, or am I boring everybody to death? This Wake up. This is Wake up on the sofa. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Well, uh, Yes and King Crimson were comparable in stature type of bands in the late 60s, except that King Crimson kicked off in 68 with a mega platinum album, which has sold millions of copies worldwide and still does to this day. Yes started off with a miserable and wretched record, <laughs> which sold almost no records and went downhill fast from there. Um, so King Crimson were the, the more popular band in London in 1968, 69, 70, 71. You wanted to work with King Crimson, not with Yes. Um, quite apart from that, I always wanted to be in King Crimson because Yes was very much geared towards entertainment. It was, in the best possible sense, you know, the, the morality was, well, you know, if you pay your, your $10, you know, admission, then it is our duty to make sure you have something called a good time. Now, I never quite understood what that meant. I thought the idea was that if you paid your $10 admission, what you wanted me to do was my best and produce the purest and most effective music I possibly could. And I'll let you judge whether you like it or not. It's the difference between entertainment and, dare I say it, the artistic method. You see, it's a, it's a different um, psychology. So these two bands sounded different and, and actually pertain to this different psychology. I always felt uncomfortable in Yes and wanted to be in King Crimson. I let this be known. Yes and King Crimson played many dates supporting each other. You know, sometimes Yes supported King Crimson, sometimes King Crimson Yes. Many dates around America. And uh, I sort of let it be known that I'd like to be in King Crimson and that this was obviously heresy because by this stage, Yes was a huge band and everybody was rolling in dollars and everybody was having a thoroughly terrific time. King Crimson had gone downhill rapidly. <laughs> as far as its earning capacity had gone. Um, and I remember telling Robert about this kind of thing, and he invited me to join his band, King Crimson, with the immortal lines um, in a Dorset accent, which I won't possibly hope to reproduce for you, to the effect of, I think you're about ready to join King Crimson now, Bill. <laughs> he always saw the, the musicians like tomatoes. Tomatoes, should we say tomatoes? like tomatoes in, in a hothouse kind of grew to fruition somewhere else, preferably in somebody else's group. Just when they were ripe for plucking, you would pick the best people for King Crimson, which is what he did. And uh, that was great. And I was thoroughly enamored of that idea. I thought it was a good approach. And we dutifully set off to make our first album called Lark's Tongues in Aspic, which was great. Am I looking at you too much? Uh, maybe I am. It's okay. <clears throat> it's hard. It's hard. It's harder to talk to a wall or something. Talk to me. Yeah. <clears throat> All the clock. Um, right. What songs do you feel show King Crimson at their best? Oh, we're nearly at the end of the interview, aren't we? Wait for the personal question. Oh, yeah, the person. I like that stuff. Um, what songs show King Crimson at its best? Well, now, uh, lots of good stuff. Uh, schizoid Man was terrific, an early, early tune that's now much dated. You know, to talk about schizoid people now is, of course, a dated kind of idea, but at the time it was hot. Then we went on and we did Lark's Tongues in Aspic, part one, which I thought was great. It was red. It was nice. But, of course, if you ask musicians like me which is his favorite tune or favorite concert, he's bound to reply the one he's about to do or the one he's working on now or the one tonight. 
because obviously the past is all just a diary of your misdemeanors, really. It's a, it's a, a futile kind of diary of all the things you can't do. I look at, I look at the last 20-odd um, albums I've been on, um, and all I, can, all I can think is, you know, how sad that I wasn't better than I was at the time. So musicians will always tell you that, that their, their, their favorite material from the band or the favorite material they're working on is the current stuff. And of course, I prefer current King Crimson music to the old stuff that we did. And consequently, Three of a Perfect Pair and Nuage and stuff like that, I think is good, modern, sensible, electronic music for grown-ups. It's not for beginners, it's for grown-ups, which is okay. Do you have any um, fond memories of yeah, lots of fond memories. That, that, that band used to uh, argue all the time as well, but I, I can remember, I think, a, a TV show from California sometime back in 1972, I think, called um, Midnight Special. It was it Midnight Special? Midnight Special, I think. And I remember playing Lark's Tongues in Aspic Part 2, which is a very odd piece of music on the whole, in some perverse kind of meter, to 21 million Americans, and thinking, this is marvelous. You know, if this is what drumming is, this is great. Because I was fully occupied, I was not, I was not routined, uh, the drumming was inventive, it was mine, the music belonged to the group, and there we were with a mass audience. And I love it when, when pop and rock, and people like me are allowed anywhere near the mass audience. That's usually a mistake, you understand. It's usually on the whole better to keep people like me and Robert away from the mass audience. But occasionally mistakes occur and, and, and uh, we are on mass television shows and I just really enjoy that kind of thing. I think it's marvellous, the idea of that particularly odd tune wafting its way across the airwaves into 21 million American households. I think it's great. We've heard about um, when you actually dived into the swimming pool with <laughs> a lot of water from Steve Howe. Have you any uh, other experiences like that? Do you do that often? Uh, <laughs> no, I don't do it often. Accidents. Um, no, I don't. Just that um, the more sober side of the group, actually, and particularly in the early days, there was never any money around. I was telling you earlier that you know, we didn't bother that much with making hit records. And consequently, we weren't really rewarded with hit money. And so we did everything on a shoestring. And that meant saving hotel bills wherever possible and driving back you know, Glasgow to London at four o'clock in the morning. That's a long way, folks, for us American friends. Glasgow to London's a long way. And we had an overpowered car, and, and uh, it was extremely dangerous. Extremely, I, I remember most of my life in Yes, and the early life, a lot of road work in England. Just uh, sitting in a pool of cold sweat most of the time <laughs> at about 90 miles an hour. And it was terrifying, absolutely terrifying. I, I then um, decided I wouldn't travel with the band. I'd make my own alternative arrangements because it was getting so suicidal. And sure enough, they did go off the road. Happily, nobody was, was slaughtered. There was no bloodbath. And Yes is now a very popular group. And, and the original members are still alive, I'm very happy to say. But it was a close call. Are you a family man? <clears throat> yes, I'm a family man. <clears throat> Absolutely. I have two little ankle biters. That's an English term, American folks, for these things, children. And uh, <laughs> I love them both dearly. And they take a lot of, a lot of uh, looking after. Um, very much. It's very important. And, of course, touring is the musician's nightmare. It's, I'm a family man, and it's difficult. There's no doubt it's difficult. But um, when I, w my wife chose to get pregnant, at around the time there was a complete collapse in the record industry, about 1976, 75, which was marvelous. Very good timing, I thought. I thought it was particularly courageous of her. So I was at home a lot because, of course, there wasn't much work for musicians and, and tours and stuff were hard to get on. But then... After that, I went to Genesis, and then things picked up again. And I'm away three or four months a year playing live concerts. And that's fine. I'm, I'm not going to do a, a big country or a, a U2, which is great for 18-year-olds. I mean, you can do it for three years, which is why if you get an 18-year-old band that that's, uh, gets a hit, you'll find the managers and record company work them like crazy for about two or three years, because they know they'll never have another opportunity to do, to do it. And every 18-year-old is only too happy to go and work for three years. But nowadays, I'm more interested in uh, moving forward and, and nurturing a talent such as it may be, rather than just flogging it around Peoria, Illinois, every you know, seven nights a week, which is what used to happen. 
Do you have any um, horrific memories from your time on the road? <laughs> horrific memories. Well, the whole thing's pretty horrific on the whole. It's, it's, of course, a lunatic occupation. I mean, just talking in more broad terms now. The idea of spending 23 hours waiting to do something for one hour is, of course, a very odd thing to do. That's what musicians do, mostly. I mean, you sleep a bit, but, but, a, but most of the 23 hours you sit and wait. Hurry up and wait. You know, for the for the rest of the band to get out of bed or for the sound check to be done or whatever it is, and that's an enormous waste of time. And you cannot you cannot be too cross with musicians who don't always want to do it. In fact, many of the best minds that I know who would in fact make an enormous contribution to pop and rock if they ever deign to do so won't join pop and rock because it's such a waste of time. You do a fantastic amount of sitting around doing absolutely nothing. I mean, this is a lovely plant, we're having a great conversation and stuff, but you understand that this is not playing. You know? And playing, if you are a player, playing is essential, it's critical. I practiced before I came here, and I will practice when I go home again today. It's like dancing, or anything physical, you know, or that requires reflex, you must keep it going. You must have understanding neighbors. I have a soundproof room. <laughs> Do you come from a musical family? Absolutely not. My family will tell you with great pride that there's not been a musician anywhere near it. In fact, I announced to my father that I was going to be a musician from Leeds University. We were talking earlier that I finally decided late on in the day at the age of 18 that the heck with Leeds University. I shall throw all caution to the wind and become a musician. And he said, what's that? <laughs> I don't think you'll ever met a musician. You know, he, he, didn't, he was a veterinary surgeon or a veterinarian, as I think we say in America. And he, he knew almost nothing about music at all. Mus musicians were, of course, all drug addicts. And, and uh, the sort of person that you let in by the servant's door. <laughs> you, know, you know, they came in with a cook, that kind of thing. And I didn't, I didn't uh, understand what he was talking about. So from then on, we didn't really get on. And it was difficult. So I'm not from a musical family. Um, but, and it took, therefore, a long time for me to actually write the word musician in my passport. You know, because I, I, I revere musicians. I think they're interesting people. I think, I think they're actually important. I know it sounds terrible, but they're kind of, it, good musicians are kind of important. Same as good painters are, and good anything, good athletes. But I mean, good musicians, you should put up with them. Suffer them kindly if you can. I know basically they, they can be a pain in, the, in the, the rear parts, but on the whole, if you struggle with them, they're all right musicians, and they, they can do some wonderful things. So it took a long time for me to say to you, you know, I am a musician. I thought, well, I'll play professionally for about 15 years and make about 30 albums, and then I'll tell you that I'm a musician. That's when you're a musician. You're not a musician the day you go to the Fender Soundhouse and buy a guitar, which is, of course, a common misapprehension. <clears throat> Tours in, in America. In America. <laughs> You've only got three words to say, woman, and <laughs> you can say I'm right. Tours on America. Um, where are we now? 1984. Uh, well, I've just finished a, a short tour with my partner, Patrick Moraz. We were talking earlier about the, um, the acoustic duo we have, Moraz and Bruford. And we've just finished a tour of America and, and Canada. And uh, I should think the next thing we do, since we're now at time of speaking, getting towards Christmas will be next spring. And I shall probably go and work in Japan with him then, which is fun. It's great. But uh, America, I don't think King Crimson is unlikely to tour next year, I should imagine, in America. Sorry, folks. Sorry, folks. It's very difficult. I promise you I try and work on Robert all the time to come and tour, but he won't. You know, he's fed up with airports. And I'm sorry, because I like to play. What can I say? I love it. Can you say <clears throat> Can I sum up Bill Bruford? What is there to sum up? It'll be very few sentences. <laughs> well, <clears throat> well, I'm kind of a survivor on the whole. You know, I, I do admire David Bowie very much. I loved his whole idea of, um, although he wasn't the first person to put it into words, but the idea of keeping two steps ahead of an audience is marvelous. It's a courtly dance whereby you you know, you flash a little thigh and, and you come and then you change and then the thigh is no longer there and then whatever it was that attracted you isn't there and you have to wait a bit and then it reappears again in a different 
different guys and it's slightly different and the game goes on and David Bowie has made a career out of changing persona and leading the, Amer the American and, and the, the, the rock audience in general, this sort of courtly dance. And uh, so for him, so it is with, with musical instruments. You must also constantly reinvigorate your instrument and come with new things. And probably as soon as the audience have understood it, drop it. It's, it's the key to survival, you see. The key to death is repetition. That's why the industry keeps getting you to repeat things, because then it throws you out like old duds at the end, you see. Whereas if you keep moving and the ideas keep coming, so the, the, the courtly dance or the chase keeps going. And it's, it's very exciting staying one step, or trying to stay one step ahead of current fashion. In my terms, it's drumming. But I, I understand it on the broader issue too. You know, for politici politicians do the same thing. David Bowie does the same thing, a past master. So on the whole, I'm a survivor, and I've made a kind of technique out of trying to stay ahead of the drumming game. Um, and on the whole, I look well on it, don't I? Do you have any time when I mean, you're not drumming? <clears throat> you're drum um, for any other hobbies? Yeah, Skelextric. Now, you won't know what Skelextric is. You're a girl. Girls never play Skelextric. That's, uh, that, you do? <laughs> For our American uh, viewers, it's a, a small model electric cars which, which can be raced and betted on <laughs> with great, great ferocity. And a, a group of half a dozen men racing small electric, electric cars about that big have been known to lose pounds and pounds in my, weight and money in my house. That's wonderful. Well, I can't think of anything else. <laughs> anything else you want to say? Oh, no. No. Like any, no. Any, sort of like any controversial stories, yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, no, no. We did meet Mayor Koch in, in New York. That was quite interesting. That's, that's only of interest in New Yorkers. Uh, no, I, yeah, I know. I should drop more names, but I'm not. I'm not. I'm, you know. Is that all right? Are we done all right?